It has been meditated upon, argued and fought over for thousands of years. Hinduism is the world's oldest faith and it brings together within it everything from the most soulful contemplation to the most boisterous rituals. Just under 80% of Indians define themselves as Hindus. India has been a majority Hindu country and the world's most diverse and plural nation for a very long time. But what does Hinduism really mean today? Can it address our deepest anxieties and our most pressing questions? Does it divide or does it unite? I will ask all those questions to some of the finest minds in the world in this very special series called Being Hindu. Welcome to a new episode of Being Hindu in a show where we consider what does contemporary Hinduism really mean in the land where it was born. Often the conversation about Hinduism in India becomes polemical, becomes argumentative, but why does it become so? What is wrong and what is right about the conversation on Hinduism in the land of its birth? These are some of the questions that we will try to find answers to from my new guest, a very interesting man, a scholar at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has been in the news recently in this entire fiasco about nationalism in JNU, giving some of the most erudite and scholarly points of views. My guest on Being Hindu, the show, this time is Professor Makarand Paranjabe. I am delighted to be with him in his office in JNU. Professor Paranjabe, thanks very much for being on the show. I'm delighted to be here too. Let me begin then with something that you said just before we started this interview. You quoted a verse to me which you said was in some senses emblematic of the way we should look at Hinduism. Do you want to repeat that for me? I shall, but I just want to sort of um, go back to our conversation because you said yeah. I don't know where my home is yeah. because I've lived in many parts of That's the right. world yeah. and uh, I said that there are two ways to look at it. Yeah. One is to say that your home is between your ears. Right. But the other way is to say that all three worlds are your home. Yeah. And that's when I quoted you the yeah. verse from Shankara, Shankaracharya, yeah. where he says, Mata me Parvati Devi, Pita Devo Maheshwara, Bandhava Shiva Bhaktascha, Swadesha Bhuvanatrayam. So he says that my mother is the Devi Parvati, yeah. my father, Lord Maheshwara, my relatives are Shiva devotees, yeah. and all three worlds are my home. So in a sense, to be Hindu is to be at home in all three worlds. So That's it's almost, what I meant. you know, you, you said it's almost contemplating a post-cosmopolitan world, at exactly. least in the mind. Absolutely, because you see, the normal identification of Hindu is with the river Sindhu. Yes. And therefore, it's really thought of as a way to describe people who lived uh, either on the banks of that river, Indus, yes. or east of the river. So all those who lived east of uh, Indus were called Hindus yeah. by the Persians and you know the Greeks use the word Indica yeah. and even now you go to China they say Indos, Hindus, Hindu. Yes. So it's mostly at least traditionally a geographical marker not a religious marker. That's right. But these Hindus who lived in this bounded land, yes. which in fact was not even a part of Asia. Originally it was Jambu Dwipa. Right. It was this floating island yes. which after the great continental drift yes. crashed into the mainland of Asia. That's right. And these Himalayas, which were beneath the surface of the oceans, sprang yes. up and yes. became the tallest mountains in the world. Yes. But really the point is that this uh, Hindu term was yes. identified with the people who lived here but these people came up with a notion of themselves which was so wide, so broad, so cosmopolitan that it transcended the cosmos yes, as we know it, the right. world. Yeah. You know, so it was not just planetary, it's not just an instance of planetarity, yes. but it's a question of being at home anywhere in the in cosmos. The yes. What does it mean then to be Hindu in the 21st century? Why should one be Hindu at all? How is it relevant? See, that's a very good question because the simple answer is that most people are not aware of being Hindu. Right. 
you know they're just born Hindu or so on and so forth and then uh, they never give it a thought. Mm. But in the 21st century somehow we've got very embattled. In mm. fact uh, some of these conflicts with identity go back to the British times, some go back even farther mm. uh, with the earlier invasions. And so in a sense the identity of Hindus or the idea of being a Hindu or the fact of being Hindu today is no longer simple. Uh, it can't be unexamined. It's almost an embattled identity. And it seems to me that this embattlement, part of it is real and part of it is a complex, is what has caused so much confusion around the idea of Hindu and Hinduism today. There seems to be a conversation, a debate if I may say so, about what does it mean to be Hindu and what is Hinduism, not just in India, but also in America, in California where this question on what is Hinduism seems to constantly bring about extremely polemical views. Why are we seeing this? We're seeing this because the Indian diaspora, especially in North America, has come of age. It has mm. burst through the glass ceiling. In Justin Trudeau's cabinet, apparently there's more than 15 ministers of Indian origin. In the United States, there are governors of Indian origin, there are people in Silicon Valley who do very well and some of their children grow up in the US mm -hmm. and uh, when they go to school they find their faith, tradition or their country being represented in really uh, I would say strange and insulting ways. Mm. You know people call it the cows caste curry school mm. of representation. So these children go home and say daddy is this who we are? Are we people who worship monsters? Are we people for whom cow shit is mm. considered an, uh, whatever very auspicious and so on and so forth. And so these uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, should I say the discontents mm. with these representations, especially see in modern Europe and America, people are very conscious to respect one another. Mm. But when Hindus are not respected and treated mm. Uh, and ridiculed and treated so shabbily mm. for what they are taught to believe mm. in. They may not even believe in those things. Mm. So we have not just Islamophobia mm. after 9-11, but we have Hindu phobia. Mm. We also have Hindu bashing. We have Hindu hate. Now these things are very real. They take on a completely different coloring because of the political configurations of our country where despite being supposedly 80%. Give us some historical context to this. Why then is the Hindu whose theological and philosophical text and understanding is so vast and all pervasive as you began this interview to by talking about, why is that being so to speak so insecure today? See that's a good question and uh, you see how we discuss these things. You use the word theology. Yeah. So theos means God. It's the same word as deva originally. Yeah. Deos, theos because the Indo-European languages yes. have common ancestry. But theology means systematic knowledge of God. Yeah. You see and this is a very Judeo-Christian Abrahamic idea mm. because these are very theocentric people. So you were asking me, how do you define a Hindu? Mm. You see, these Hindus are were very interesting people because the, the Jews and the uh, Christians and the Muslims were theocentric, they were God-centric. Mm. And they were great believers in this one God, you see. They were monotheists, so the cardinal uh, point of the Islamic faith is La Allah illallah. There's no other God than but Allah, but yes. Allah etc. Yeah. So now you see, so they were radically theocentric. Yes. Now after the Renaissance in Europe, they tried to get out of this, uh, in a way, mindset which was brainwashing them and restricting their capacity to evolve because the so-called Dark Ages. Uh, you know, most Europeans, most Christians, were terrorized by the idea of hell and mm. sin and damnation and saving your soul and that kept them in a very restricted sphere. So all these rebellions starting with Luther and ending with the Enlightenment where the power of religion was dislodged 
This happened in the Christian world. That's It right. has not happened in the Islamic world. That's right. The power of religion has not been dislodged mm -hmm. in the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. So what happened in Europe was from being theocentric, they became anthropocentric. Mm. They became focused on humanism. Mm. So Renaissance contributed humanism that mm. in what in Urdu they call insaniyat. Mm. Only some left-wing people, you know, they said insaniyat sabse badi cheez hai. And there's a wonderful Hindi song, tu Hindu banega na musalma banega, insan ki aulad hai insan ne. This is the, this is the creed of these people who are the left uh, progressive writers yes. in Urdu who were wonderful. Yes. But you see, when this battle happened for the capture of the Muslim mind, mm. the people who were leading scholars and thinkers and writers, they won the literary battle. But not they the, lost the political oh, battle. Yeah, yeah. So they, Pakistan was born, yeah. which is a theo, theological state, state a theo, yeah. you might say theocratic state, yeah. and an Islamic state. So this dream of a composite India was shattered. So my submission is that whereas the traditional Judaic people, Judaic meaning Christian and Muslim and Jews, were theocentric, and the modern people of Europe were anthropocentric, yes. like Marx and everybody, yeah. Freud, the Hindus were radically self-centric. Mm. Now, what is the self-centrism? Because what is this, they see, this self, which the Hindus call Atma, and the Buddhists call Anatma in a way, but they're similar. Yeah. So these people said that, who are you? They didn't say, who is God? Who made this world? I mean, the Nasadiya Sutra says yes. in the Rig Veda, we don't know. Yeah, we don't right. know. And he says, you know, the, the Rishi says, maybe the one who made this world knows, or maybe even he doesn't, mm. because what was before him? So these people said, what do I start with? I start with myself. Yeah. So I said, I ask myself, who am I? And this self that I am for a Hindu becomes wider and wider. And so it's not a self other. You are not my other. You're not my enemy. You're not my, in a way, I mean, Raja Rao put it very well. He says, India has no enemies. It only has adversaries. Mm. So, you see, so the point is, these are radically self-centric people, these Hindus. And uh, they were asking certain kinds of questions for hundreds and thousands of years. Mm. But they, they were not saying we, were, we are Hindus or we are this or that. So they had a very decentralized system, not one book, not one God, not one church, not one prophet. And these decentralization made it easy for others to attack them, to convert them, mm. to rule them, to conquer them. So in the last 100, 200 years after the British conquest of India, especially in Bengal and other parts of India, people started thinking. They said, Istaratu will be finished. And Max Muller put it very well. He said, there are two kinds of religions, one that proselytize and one that don't. Mm. So the logic is that those who proselytize will take over the world and uh, the others will lose their members. And so these Hindus said we should also organize. Mm. And in organizing themselves and trying to come up with some definition or central ideas, mm. paradoxically they became like those they were resisting. Mm. And in the process went through this identity crisis, which is today even the crisis of the majority. Because in India, so the crisis is persisting even today, you're saying? Very much so, because the political history of independent India is that to be a Hindu is not fashionable. Mm. You see, you should be secular. So under the name of secularism, you divide the Hindus and you create a minoritarian coalition. Mm. So with the rise of BJP, everybody's running scared because the genie is out of the bottle. Mm. You see, there was no, no need, so to speak, for this Mili Juli Sanskriti because they ruled mm. in, with an iron fist. Yeah. Balban, yeah. Aladdin Khilji, these people ruled, you know, they were despotic. Mm. It's only when the Mughals came yeah. and especially Akbar, Akbar they yeah. said, let's create a new kind of India. Composite. Uh, you can call it that. Look, I'm, I've got trouble with this idea of composite identity right. and all that. But, but a more but intermingled, so to speak. That's right. And, and Akbar did a lot. Yeah. But you see, Akbar was not uh, respected by the ulema. Ah. So after him, you know, instead of Dara Shukur, Aurangzeb won. Yes. 
So you see, in these moments, now later on again, as I said, the progressive writers lost. Yes, the political and, battle. And the Aligarh Muslim University, which yes. was founded for progressive Islam, yes. f made Pakistan possible because the ideologues came from there. So, in a very, so it was taken over in, in a sense. You know, no, but somehow the idea of a Muslim state at that time was appealing. But today, you ask most Muslims in India, they will not support that idea. Yes. So, in a sense, we don't have a Hindu-Muslim problem in India, yes. frankly. Yes. Because the Muslims are not against either Hindus or yes. against their symbols. Yes. No Muslim wants to eat beef, I tell yes. you. This is a created conspiracy. Hindus are fighting Hindus. Mm. This is a civil war. Mm. You see, Muslims are not going to go to a temple and throw something there. They're not interested. Unko to rozi roti chahiye. They want education. Mm. The women want to come out and mm. get their rights. Yes, 70,000 Muslim women wrote to the Prime Minister yes. against the triple talaq. So, you see, it's a big issue. Yeah. And the past governments have been saying no. Because let, let the mullahs, let the conservative elements... Keep stoking the fire. Keep, no, keep controlling them uh, and we'll get their votes. Uh, so the Islamic renaissance in yes. India, and India is the place for it, I tell you, mm. has not fully happened. So this is a fascinating point to ask you. If there are three great ideas of the Hindu mind, you know, we, 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 we talk about a 5,000 year civilization, some say it's a 10,000 year civilization. Whatever timeline it may be, at the end of the day, it's a very large history, right? In that, two or three key ideas, if I were to ask you three key ideas of the Hindu mind, the definitive three, which one would you choose? See, uh, Hindu, you've put me on the spot in this world of sound bites and instant nirvana. <laughs> yeah. But I'll hazard a few guesses. Okay. You see, the first great idea, yeah. I feel, is Ekam Sat Vipra Vahuda Vadanti. Yeah. Now, this is a Rigvedic injunction yes, and right. it's very, very interesting that the seer mm. who says it, his name was Dirgha Tamas. Now, we don't know why, but some people say he was blind. Oh. But so he had inner vision. But the next uh, sort of line of this couplet is Shurasya Dhara, that is, the path is like walking on the razor's edge. So we should read both these in conjunction. But the real thing, the great thing about this, is when you say ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti it means you accept the unity of truth mm. whereas postmodernism doesn't accept that mm. it becomes fragmented it becomes you know centrifugal it becomes relativistic and therefore creates confusion enemy discord alienation but when there's unity of truth mm. it creates harmony so but Truth is one, but the wise call it by many names. Mm. The moment you accept that, you are enshrining pluralism. Mm. You are enshrining multiculturalism. You are enshrining, you know, the principle that many types of people, races, religions, mm. communities mm. can thrive in this area. Mm. And you are removing the basis of religious conflict. When you say, because when you say, Ekam Sat, it's, it's, the, it's similar or analogous to La Ila Illa. So there's no other because truth is one. Truth is but you're also saying that. the wise call it by many names. Yes. Someone calls it Allah, someone else calls it something else, yes. God, someone yes. else calls it not even God, they yes. call it Dharma. Yes. So that's the one great thing. Yes. Then the other thing is very radical and which the Abrahamic faiths can never accept, mm. except in certain moments, mm. like when Jesus says, my father and I are one. You would have guessed it. Mm. It is one, you know, these great Mahavakyas of the Upanishad, Tattva Masi, mm. you know, Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi is an amazing mm. thing. It's the same thing that this great Sufi Al Halad said, yes. Al Haq, yes. I am the truth. Yes. And Usko to Suli pe chada diya, because right. it's not allowed right. to say that. But a Hindu can say, the Hindu can say, I'm divine. He can say, You're divine. And he or she can say that this is divine. Yes. This is divine. This yes. camera may be, which brings you to the one, three, third thing, mm. the very first line of the Ishavasya Upanishad. Mm. And Gandhiji was a very great Hindu, as we know. Mm. He said it himself. He said, I'm a Sanatani Hindu. Of course, he redefined Sanatanism. 
But he said that if everything in Hinduism was lost, but this couplet was saved, Hinduism would still remain. Mm. And what is this? Isha vasya midam sarvam, yat kincha jagatyam jagat, tena tyak tena bhunji tha, ma grida kasyas vidhanam. So, what he's saying, what the Rishi is saying here is, even the first line, Isha Vasya Madam Sarva, that everything that is, is permeated by that Divine Spirit. Mm. So, you see, Aap mein bhi khuda hai, Mujh mein bhi khuda hai, Mitti mein bhi khuda hai, Har jagay hai, Har karn mein wo baitta hai. Aur wo aisi koi bhi jagay nahi, jaha wo hai nahi. So, this is a great thing to say. And that's when you stop, you have no, as you use the word theology, we have no theological disagreements right. with any, any religion. Way, yeah. The real disagreements are social, mm. they are political, they are theological to the extent that if someone says, suppose I am a Christian and I say, I worship Jesus, mm. a Hindu will say, sure, <laughs> cool, right? But if the Christian says, you will go to hell, if you don't worship. No, because you're worshipping a ten-armed goddess. Yeah. Or you're worshipping Ram. Tu to narg mein jayega. Ya tu jahannam. That's a problem. That's problem. So you see, Hindus don't have problems with anyone, any form of worship. But if someone is trying to tell them, you can't do this, ye haram hai, that's a problem. You see? So the conflict starts there. And the, all the other conflicts yes. are political and social. You and see, we, to, uh, I'll just say yeah, one yes, more thing. Yeah. You see, the history of Islam in yes, India yeah. has two sides to it. Yes. There is a very bad side, yes. which we don't want to talk about. Yeah, Aurangzeb, four million. Not just Aurangzeb, throughout, it was very destructive. Yeah. Many temples were destroyed yes. and looted. Yes, Somnath famously. Many. Yeah. Now why? You see, everybody wants money. Mm. Mm. See, people think this is religion. It's not just religion. Mm. See, if, you, if, if I want your money, and if your money is in the bank, I loot the bank. But if all your money is in, t in the temple, I loot the temple. Right. So I'm saying the jhagda is political, it's financial, it's social, but it's not theological. Fair enough. Tell me, a lot of people ask for a civilization that said, Aham Brahmasmi, Tattva Masi. How did that civilization come to a point where an Ambedkar had to fight back and fight back vigorously and, and point out again and again that it's all very well to say Ham Brahmasmi, it's all very well to say Tatva Masi, but on the ground, large sections are being exploited. How did that happen? No, but you see, Hindol, I yeah. mean, we are... What do we, we do with are, caste? I mean, no, no, we'll come to that. I'm yeah. saying we are very habituated to yeah. thinking that this is a problem of the Hindus. Mm. It's not. It's a problem of every religious community. Mm. Mm. See, in Islam, they accept the brotherhood of man. Mm. But Islam was one of the greatest slaving and slave-owning yes. civilizations of the world. Yes. That's how you get that word, abad. Mm. That's how you think, you see, band, banda, bandagi. You see the people, why, why was Qutbuddin Aibak, why did they say it's slave dynasty? Mm. He was a Mamluk, Mamluk, yeah. sorry, he came from Egypt, That's he right. was a slave. Yeah. And it was a, considered a very low caste, and a very polluting caste. Yeah. Huh? And he had these four dogs with him. And uh, when the Shankaracharya walked, mm. this Chandal walked right in front. So Shankaracharya said, hey, you, when, if you cross my path, I'll get polluted. I just took a bath and this man quoted him. He said, when, who is saying these words to whom? Who, is, who will be polluted and who will pollute whom? And Shankaracharya realized that this man was self-realized and he was saying, when you say, Aham Brahmasmi, how can there be any difference? If I am divine, you are That's divine, right. what makes me untouchable? That's right. Am I the untouchable Shiva? Right. You see, so this is what Narayan Guru said when the, you know, orthodoxy yes. said, you can't be establishing temples, you're yeah. not a Brahmin. Yeah. He said, don't worry, I'm, I am establishing a untouchable Shiva. <laughs> you establish the touchable. touchable Shiva. So, you see, so Hinduism is very creative. Yes. It is not merely oppressive. And right. the story is Shankaracharya 
fell at the feet of the Chandal because he was Shiva. And the four barking dogs were the four Vedas. And they were interrogating the symbol of Brahminical. It's a beautiful story. So please don't think that Dr. Ambedkar was the first one. Sure. The whole Bhakti movement, yes. look at Chaitanya. Yes. That was the politics of embrace. That's right. Where is Chua Chut? When I embrace you, yes. regardless of your caste, yes. Ramanuja did that. Yes. And even today, yes. there are called, yeah. so called, white Iyengars and black Iyengars. That's right. That's the black right. Iyengars were the people that were elevated uh -huh. by him, so to speak, elevated, but given equal rank. So this is not new and it's not unprecedented. And that's where we can respectfully disagree with mm. Baba Sahib, mm. where he equates Hinduism with caste oppression. Fair enough. Hinduism is much more than that. But please, what's important today, and we see it in the diaspora, yes. we have to take an unequivocal position against any caste oppression or yes. inequality. Fair enough. That is very important. The message must go out that modern Hinduism has nothing to do with caste uh, in terms of a hierarchical formation. Yeah. But you see, caste is jati, as mm. community, mm. is uh, very important even to mobilize mm. and democratize and empower sections. Mm. That's how you can explain Mayavati's rise to power. Mm. So let me just say this to you, that first of all, caste to me is not intrinsic to Hinduism. Mm. It is a social expression of an entire society and permeates all communities here, even Muslims. They have the Ashraf, who are the Sharif, mm -hmm. and they have the Ajalav, mm -hmm. the, and they won't marry you. Go to UP, and you know those, those who are Kasai and this and that, they, they cannot marry, they cannot hope to marry the people who have been descended, who have descended from the Turks and mm -hmm. the Afghans and the, uh, you know, the Persians, the Iran. I mean, they're also Fesk and blah, blah, blah. And the Christians had just different churches, mm -hmm. you know, from I mean, the Syrian Christian church has... Syrian, Syrian Christians claim to be the five Brahmins yes. converted by St. Thomas, blah, blah. So this is a pervasive sign of Indian society. And let me also suggest that it is the way... And so this is the paradox of caste in modern India, that there is an erasure of caste in the Savarnas and an assertion of caste in the Avarnas. That mm. is to say, the top castes do not go by caste anymore. They, they erase their markers mm. and they find it embarrassing. So be, and the lower castes are constantly assertive. No Dalit. You see, the Dalit is not a caste. Dalit is a consolidation mm. along caste lines. So what we've got is a new caste system in India, which is underwritten by the government of India's policies of reservation. Very interesting. And this caste system functions in terms of three or four types. Mm. One is the general category. In, in the general category, the distinctions are only for purposes of marriage and mm. alliances and all that, but they don't operate on a daily basis. Mm. Originally, caste was endogamy and commensality, that is, you could eat with your caste and marry in your caste. Mm. But now that doesn't obtain. Mm. Uh, marriage still a bit, but otherwise, in the so-called general category, there's very easy mingling. Mm. And then there is the intermediate category. You may call it OBC, BC, OBC, and uh, Mayavati, Kanshi Ram, I mean the whole Bahujan Samaj movement. And all regional parties, primarily, I mean, almost all are along, along caste lines. You know, um, Samajwadi and Lalu Prasad. See, this is all a mobilization along caste lines. So this is the paradox of caste that now you see it, now you don't. As we come to the end of this interview, I have a couple of last questions. One is coming from all that we've discussed right now. This idea that India is, is it or is it not a Hindu nation? Now, some people have argued that politically, constitutionally, it is a plural nation. It is a secular nation, even though the word secular was brought in much later, but it is truly a plural nation. And that pluralism actually comes from the inherent pluralism of the philosophy of Hinduism. But because numerically it is, uh, you know, 80% Hindu, there is a resonance of many Hindu values within society. So politically it is a plural nation, but there are many resonances of Hindu philosophical values in society. Where do you stand in that debate on whether India is a quote-unquote a Hindu nation or not? I think you've already answered it because 
You have to ask this question at many levels. And yeah. if you're asking it at the level of the constitution of yes. India, it is not a Hindu nation. Right. It's a secular nation sure. where all citizens, yes. regardless of their religion or community, have equal oh, rights. Of and I think we should respect that. Sure. But it is a Hindu nation or a nation of Hindus to the extent that it's a majority Hindu country with almost 80% yeah. people are Hindus. It's like saying, Agar tumhare aankhon mein nami nahi hai, you don't care for your fellow beings, yeah. then you're useless. So jis muh mein ram nahi hai, you don't remember, like you don't have gratitude. Yes. You don't think about a the higher truth. Higher truth. Yes. Why am I here? What is the True. purpose of life? Mm. That life is wasted. That is to say, Hinduism shows you that you're here on this earth. Mm. It's like a bridge. You don't build a house on the bridge. Yes. You cross the bridge. Where do you cross to? Gandhiji said it beautifully. He said, Mujhe jab hisab dena padega, huh. when I stand before my maker, Mujhe mera sar nahi jhukana padega. Main us tere jiyu, that he, Mujhe sharminda nahi hona padega. So, jo muk ram nahi, wo muk dhul bhari. That means if I don't remember, the higher truth, the higher reality, the higher values. What's the use of my life? Fascinating. On that wonderful note, thanks very much, Professor Pranjavi, for this wonderful conversation. Thank You're you very so much. You're so welcome. You're Thank welcome. You.